Hey, welcome back to, uh, to Beta. Shh, 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 shh. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, uh, this is uh, week four. We have two more weeks. Um, if, if you happen to miss, I can email. If you know folks that are missing, I can email the, the notes to them. We are, <clears throat> we are videoing the, uh, these sessions, so you can have uh, them. I uh, hope you're enjoying uh, and, and just really seeing the, 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 the work of God's Spirit through the writing of Ephesians. I mean, I am, I was just telling our table a minute ago, just something I saw that I just never, I'm sure, I know I've read it. I've read it, God knows how many times I've read it, but I just finally saw it. Um, and uh, I'd love to tell you, but then I'm not gonna have time to go through everything I'm going through right now. So you can ask the people at our table tonight afterwards. Um, all right, well, what I wanna do as we start every, um, every session that we have together um, is, is to just go through uh, our, our life uh, uh, acronym here and uh, just look at these lines. What's the L stand for? Do you remember? That is right. Lingering in the presence of God. I yeah, interact with the Word of God. Let, and that's what we're doing here. That's what you're doing when you do the homework. That's what we're doing when... Uh, when after I finish talking in a minute, you're gonna, we're going to be interacting with the Word of God again. F stands for? Okay, yeah, fellowship with the children of God. That's what we're doing. We're doing that here. That's what we're doing as well. And, and the next one, the E, is when we take it to the streets, right, and into our homes, and we evangelize with the love of God, okay? And since, I mean, this is, this, and what we're going to talk about in terms of unity tonight is really important. So, what I want to do is this. I want to ask you to open your Alpha Bible if you have it. If you don't have it, then uh, I want you to turn to uh, page uh, 10, I think it's 1080. If it's not 1080, it's thereabouts 1080. And I want us to pray. I want us to pray from Ephesians. I want us to pray Ephesians chapter 3. It's on page 1080. Verse 14, it's the top of page 1080 on the right-hand column. You, and if you're, you're not with me, you can follow. Again, one, one of the things I want us to do is, because I want to do this more and more, is to pray the Scripture back to God. Okay, And I think the Lord loves when we do that. I know He loves when we do it because they're His, His words that He's given us to pray back to Him. And so let's just pray this together. I may say it differently than what is written here, but... That's fine. That's fine. So, so let's pray together. Um, first off, before I pray that, I just want to pray, Father, thank you for um, gathering us here tonight. Uh, Lord, thank you that you love when we gather together. Uh, Lord, I, I know how much I love when my family is together. The joy I derive just out of watching and eavesdropping. Um, but Lord, you're, you're in every conversation and you love being in every conversation. You love us uh, infinitely more than we can imagine. And yet, Lord, that is the love that you have placed within us because you have placed you in us so that we can love one another in that very same love. And I thank you that you're going to teach us more about that tonight. But Lord, and because of this, Lord, for this reason, we bow our knees before you, Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that, Lord, according to the riches of your glory, would you grant us, Lord, even tonight to be strengthened with power through your spirit in our inner being so that, Jesus, you would dwell in our hearts through faith and that we, being rooted and grounded in love, Lord, that we'd have strength to comprehend along with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth. And, Lord, to know the love of Christ, Jesus, to know your love that surpasses our natural ability to know anything so that, Lord, we would be filled up to all of your fullness. So, Lord, now to you who are able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think according to your power, which is at work within us, Lord, to you be the glory in your church of which we are a part of and in Christ Jesus whom we are in 
throughout all generations, forever and ever, until you come again or we see your face. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Isn't that awesome? That is awesome. Thank you. That is good. Do that. That's good. Okay, so um, tonight, as I have here, Ephesians 4, verse 1 through 32, biblical walking means we are walking while we are still seated. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to do that. Physically, it could be a problem. Uh, um, But that's what we do. It's not like we forget all those truths and now we walk. We, We walk from a position in Christ being seated with him in the heavenly realms. Because we are seated with Christ, now we understand more than we did, and we understand that I have already been accepted, as accepted as I will ever be. And so my doing is not to earn acceptance, or my not doing, or my, my, you know, my not doing something bad is so that I'm not all of a sudden pulled out of Christ. Because I am in Christ, and I see that by the Spirit's gifting, I can now walk in a manner worthy of my calling. And so I want us to see this, that unity, we're going to talk about unity, this very first verse of chapter 4, verse 1 through 32. Uh, I I do want to, you've got it in your notes already, but I want to quote it to us again. Um, This is what it says. I therefore, Paul says, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you, now you see what what's the there what, why is the therefore there right the therefore is there based on everything that he has just taught Paul has just taught us in the previous 3 chapters all those past completed word, words all that me in Christ all that us in Christ I urge you therefore as a prisoner for the Lord remember Paul is imprisoned when he's writing this letter from Rome we talked about that I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Let me tell you, if you are in Christ, there is no higher calling. If you were voted to be president of the United States, okay, whatever the head of the UN is called, it does not matter. There is no higher calling than the call that you and I have been given in Jesus Christ. So walk, because you've been seated, in a manner that looks like you are actually in Christ, and Christ is in you, and you are his son or daughter, and he is your God, okay? To just sit and think about that should change us, should transform us. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Okay, so this is, this is how this, now we're, this is how we're walking now. I'm going to be careful. And as I am humbled, and as I'm gentle, and as I am patient, and I can only be that way because Christ is that way, not my humility, Christ's humility, not my gentleness, Christ's gentleness, not my patience. My patience sucks. I mean, I am not a very patient man. I probably shouldn't have said that. My patience is not very patient. Um, so please be patient with me for saying the word, you know, thank you. Uh, so anyway, just wanted to give you an opportunity. Uh, so, um, so, so that's worthy. Do you think about that one? Lord, I, today when I, my pillow, my head's coming off the pillow, Lord, I, today I want to be clothed in Christ that I will walk in a manner worthy. I want to look like who I am, not who I was. I want to look like who you are in me not who I was in me. So, um, so unity with God equals power, okay? Now, there are two kinds of power. There's power for evil. That unity power is a united power for evil, and there's a united power for good, which is our being united in Christ. I just wrote this stupid little thing here. Contrary to Three Dog Night, one is not the loneliest number. (laughs) If you're thinking biblically, that is. Biblically, the number one, it's the most powerful number there is. That oneness that we have in Christ. And then Paul hammers home the power 
of at least seven ones, okay? And this is, these are they here that Paul just, he's, Paul is trying to get the point home so strongly. He wants these Ephesians and he wants us to, to get this unity thing, okay? There is one body. There is one spirit. There is one hope of your calling. There is one Lord. There is one baptism. There is one God and Father of all. And he could have gone and kept on going, but he wants to, uh, for us to understand this. He wants us to see our union in Christ and our union with one another and the power of that and how that gets walked out. So Paul hammers home the power of at least seven ones. And speaking of hammering, let's talk about Noah's Ark and the Tower of Babel, okay? So, um, there are about 105 years between Noah's Ark having been built, completed, and the generations that came after Noah to Babel. About 105 years. A generation, you look at a generation from 30 to 35 years, about 105. 506 years. I gave you guys the dates here as they are assumed uh, and not, in, uh, not unintelligently assumed. Um, so what you're seeing there is what? About 106 years. Okay? So, so in just a little span of time, 106 years, we see God destroying creation, all but Noah and his family. So the, an interesting question. Don't have time for this. It's an interesting question. Um, so in case you want to raise it, um, I have no, I don't know the answer, um, but how many people are on the earth in that span of 105, 106 years? I don't know. It could be thousands. How many were at Babel? I don't know. But those men at Babel had a plan. They had a unifying plan. So let's read that together. It's in your notes. I've got it on the screen here for those of you who are watching live stream that may not have the notes. Hey, if you need the notes, forgive me for saying it. If you need the notes, just email the church, Georgina at LakeviewChristianCenter.com. If you email it to Frank at LakeviewChristianCenter.com, I will never see it because I never open that. But maybe I will, perchance. But go for the real thing, Georgina at LakeviewChristianCenter.com, and we will email the notes to you. Okay. Now, the whole earth, here's Genesis chapter 11. Uh, Noah's Ark, chapter 6. Now, the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built and the Lord said behold they are one people they are as one people. They are one people. And they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord disperse them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building they left off building the city therefore its name was called babel because there the lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth wow wow now i want us to see here the power of unity and God's appreciation of unity, but unity that is united in such a way to undo God's plans in light of man's plans. So let's just take a look at some of these words real quickly.
because we have much to do tonight. And the Lord said, behold, they are, do you see this? One people. They have one language. And they have one purpose. And if they're successful, whatever that means, nothing will be impossible for them. Now, our, and that's my brilliant grandson. They're all brilliant. But um, <laughs> as he was talking, he just happened to bring up, I was, I've been was studying, preparing for this this weekend. And so it turns out that he was talking about, he was thinking about the Tower of Babel. I'm like, well, this is very interesting. And, and Nathan said, oh, uh, sorry, Nathan said, um, I think the reason they were building a tower is because they were afraid God would flood them out again. <laughs> and I thought, dang. <laughs> I had thought about that. <laughs> um, now, I don't think that they were attempting to build a tower that there was eventually going to reach heaven. Now, again, I have no idea what these guys were thinking. No idea um, what they were thinking. Um, but whatever it was, it got God's attention. And the Lord says, again, I don't get these things. These are things that, that it, I don't have time to, to try to unpack. Nothing will be impossible for them, right? They want to make a name for who? For God? No, they want to make a name for themselves, right? That's, now, again, we don't put a, a, a lot into names. Like, Peter, why are you named Peter? Do you have any idea why you're named Peter? No, I know, no, I can tell you why. That's right. Because you are, man, you are the rock, baby. Yeah, you're the rock. Now, now why am I, yeah, why, yeah, you're right, right. Yeah, 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 but, so, and why is my name Frank? I mean, like, because he's going to grow up and be a hot dog. That's why his name is Frank. I mean, I don't know why my name is Frank or Bob or Gail or, I mean, we don't think about those things anymore. Like, we have a young man in this church. He's not in this church anymore. He's grown up, and his name is Jacob. Now, who the heck knows what Jacob means? And then you come to church and you find out the name Jacob means supplanter, cheater. And so this young man asks his father, Dad, we had a men's retreat and it was called No Longer Jacob. A poor kid needed counseling. Um, but nobody knows that. We don't know what a name means. A name, a name means something. So, uh, so they wanted to make a name for themselves, right? The name of Jesus is a name of authority. They, they wanted to be in charge. They wanted to build something that in their depraved way of thinking, only a hundred years after God wipes out everything, that they are going to be in control. And God says... Nothing will be impossible for them for what they propose to do, whatever they're proposing to do. And God says, I will confound their language. Now, here's the thing. If, because I, I, I'm, I'm, I knew I was going to do this. Um, so, if nothing is impossible for those who want to make a name for themselves, if nothing will be impossible for those who desire to, in a united way, overthrow God, what would be possible for those who do not want to make a name for themselves, but united desire to make a name for God? Now, do, do you see how, if this gets God's attention, what attention must God give to a united group of men and women in Christ. And we see that. We see that in John chapter 17. Uh, at Babel, man looks to make a name for himself. At the cross, Jesus gives of himself so that we get his name and all that accompanies having his name for the glory of his father. And so here is Jesus. It's John. This is John 17. It is Jesus last day on earth. It's the night before he is given the night that he is given over by Judas 
to the centurion, so to, rather, to the praetorian guard to be given over to the high priest and the Sanhedrin who will give him over to Herod and then give him over to Pilate and then to the cross. And this is Jesus' prayer before he is to be handed over. And he says this. Again, just, could we try to do this? Could we just try to be there right now? It's that night. It's a cool night. It's a night that Jesus knows the end is near. He is about to sweat drops of blood, which is physiologically possible under that type of stress. And this is what Jesus is saying to his father. Father, I don't ask for these only. Okay, what was he asking? That he would sanctify them right before this. He says, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is the truth. He says, I do not ask for these only. Okay, this is good for us. But also for those who will believe in me through their word. That is us. Why? Why? Why do you not ask for these only? That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that, this is why, the world, those who are still in Adam, may believe that you have sent me. Sorry. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them. That they may be, what, one even as we are, I and them, you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know. He says it again. So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them. How? How did he love them? Even as you loved me. You ever read that before? Do you, do you, I've read that before. Father... I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world, those in Adam do not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them, that's his disciples, your name. And I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Okay, let me just read that again. The love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Do you get that? I don't know how much I get that. I need to get that more than I get that. Now, that's either truth or some ridiculous hyperbole from some fantastical story. Jesus is not praying this if this is not what his desire and belief is that the Father is to give and to reveal to us. So when we go back to the prayer we read tonight, the very last two verses, to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly more, then you can ask or even imagine according to his power, which is at work within you, that to him would be the glory in his church and in Christ Jesus to all generations. This, I think this, this is part and parcel of it. Can you imagine? I cannot imagine understanding that God's love, for, for the Father's love for Jesus equals his love for me. And that's when we see this. Okay, back to verse, um, back to verse twenty-one. That they may all be one. How? How one? How one? How? What are we talking about? Well, Father, Dad, just as you are in me and I in you. That, that's what the kind of one is I'm talking about. That they also may be in us. Why? so that the world may believe such a unity, such a love, such a calling in the midst of such unity in the midst of diversity that those without him see him. Let me ask you, when, when God called you to himself, did you see something different about others that was attractive to you, that made you think, 
something about that guy, something about that lady, different. Now that's all God's working. But this aspect of unity is so big, so big to God, it is something that he creates. Um, so, um, I, I, I just wrote here, because of the churches, that's all of those in Christ, unity with, the all, with Almighty God, this is in your notes, creator of all things, and because we have been created in him to share in the unity the Trinity has within themselves, that same unity that Father, Son, Holy Spirit have within themselves, that is the same unity that we have with him and with one another. We now have power in Christ, in that name, the powers in the name of Christ to reveal that unity to one another, I could say, and to a lost and divided. My God, is the world divided and getting more and more divided every day. And God forbid that the church continues to go that same route because Jesus will build his church and the gates of hell will not, the gates of division will not prevail against it. This cross-created unity results in peace with God and with one another so that the world sees the wonder of the fact that God sent Christ and loves those in Christ in the same way he loves his son. Daggum. And all that looks like, that glory of God looks like what every one of us have been made participants of and recipients of. And so let's go, we were in Genesis, let's, let's go to the next book, Exodus. Why not? Um, then we'll be in Leviticus and then Deuteronomy and we'll be over sometime <laughs> next year. Exodus 33, Moses wants to see God's glory. They're in the wilderness. Moses is up on Mount Sinai. Moses just said, God, if you're not going with us, we ain't going anywhere. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. And Moses said, please show me your glory. Sorry. Come on. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. Get a little picture here of the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face you shall not see. Okay, so, so we see here God is setting this up. You want to see my glory? You're only going to get to see a particular moment. You can't see my face and die. Not because God is uh, humble about how he looks or concerned about how he looks or insecure about how he looks. He just knows if you look straight on into the face of God, you will die. It's just, just that simple. You get close, too close to the physical sun, you will die. If you see the unveiled glory of God, you will die. So let's go, let's continue. So in Exodus 34, the very next chapter, we get a little bit more glimpse of this. This is, uh, this is five through seven. I think I told you nine, but it's five through seven. The Lord descends, so here goes, the Lord descends into the cloud and stood with Moses there and proclaimed the name of of the Lord. You see how we keep getting the name? Let's make a name for ourselves. You know, it talks about the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed. Okay, so here's Moses is tucked in the cleft of the rock, hand covering the cleft. The Lord is speaking. I don't know who he sounded like. Cecil B. DeMille. I have no, Morgan Freeman. I don't know who he sounded like. I have no idea. Um, uh, I'm sure he didn't sound like Tiny Tim. I mean, could you imagine how disappointing that would be? <laughs> weird the lord the lord okay he says his name he repeats it the lord a god now, okay here's the glory of god he can't see his glory so moses gets to hear what glo god's glory looks like now, did you hear that 
He can't see His glory, so He gets to hear what God's glory looks like. What does it look like? Merciful, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. If you will not repent or your children or your children's children. But here is the glory of God, his mercy, his graciousness, his patience, his slowness to anger, his abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, his keeping steadfast love. See, that's what the glory of God looks like. I wrote here, the glory of God, which is displayed in us through the unity of the Spirit and revealed in relational unity, first with God and then with one another, looks like living life out together as the church. That looks like putting on the new self, which is created in the likeness of God in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Not lying, but speaking truth. Experiencing anger without sinning. Not giving the devil an opportunity to divide. Not stealing, but working and sharing with those who have need. This manifested unity speaks totally for the purpose of edifying and bringing grace to the hearer and by no means grieving the Holy Spirit. It looks like bitterness, anger, clamor, and slander being put away from us along with all malice. Instead, it looks like kindness, tenderheartedness, and forgiveness in the very same way that God in Christ forgave us. And that, to the world, looks like the inexplicable glory of God which radiates out from we who by God's grace have become temples of the Holy Spirit. See, the glory of God is that which we as the church of Jesus Christ united with him, we now have his glory to be able to be able to be merciful as God is merciful, gracious as God is gracious, slow to anger as God is slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness as God is that is what we, who are the church of Jesus Christ, united with him, are to be about as we are united with him and united to one another. That is the power of God. The power of God in his church is God. And his glory looks like this to himself, and it is to look like that through us to one another. That is the that is the manifestation of the glory of God that each of us have because we have the Spirit of God living in us and are to manifest the glory of God. You want to manifest the glory of God? Who would say no? No, nah, not interested really. Here's what the glory of God looks like. It looks like this. In all humility, with gentleness and patience. This is what this looks like. And it's, what, it's why we have a problem as a church if this is not what the church looks like, we're not walking in a manner worthy of our calling. How? Because Christ has empowered us by his name to express his glory. Who else is going to do that? Excuse me? No one is going to be able to do that because no one's empowered with the only one who can do that. And so, so, and so Jesus says, John 13... A new commandment I give you. Okay, well, this is why it's new, okay? I give to you that you love one another. Here's the new part. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Love is the great unifier. And God is love. And his glory looks like all those things we just finished talking about, which are the manifestation of love. Slowness to anger is love. Gentleness is love. Compassion is love. Forgiveness of transgressions, sins, and iniquities is love. That's all God, and that is all that all of us have. And that's what he wants to communicate to us and through us. And so the world will know that God sent his son. 
That's why. He's made us one with him and one with one another so that the world will know, so that we will know and that the world will know that God sent his son. So what does that look like? What does that look like? Well, the biggest picture, the best picture Jesus gave us of what union with him and one another looks like is really the picture of communion. It's the picture of communion as a God gives. So what we're going to do tonight is, if you'd like, I would like us to see what communion looks like, but also to understand better what communion is and maybe see what it's not in the meantime, okay? So... um, Somebody gave me gloves. I'm not going to use gloves. Um, so what? Um, so on the night that Jesus was betrayed, in that Passover meal, what he did was he didn't take he didn't take bread like this. Let me make a noise. He didn't take bread like this, but he took bread. And he broke it and gave it to his disciples, and he said, I'm going to do this for you. He said, this is my body, okay? This is my body, which is given for you. Now, when you look at this piece of bread, this is what Jesus was saying is, he's not saying this is my body, but he wants to give them a picture. I am one lump, all right? I am one lump. This is my one body. And I will be given for you. And he took the bread, and what did he do? He broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he began to give them pieces, 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 of this bread that would be broken and distributed to each and every one of them. Now, where are these pieces coming from? They're coming from one lump. They're coming from one loaf is what's happening. And he wanted them to see this. He wanted them to see that when you take the pieces of the bread, they come from one body of bread. And so when you, Katie, ingest that bread, and Flo, when you ingest the bread, and Sarah, when you ingest, and Justin, you ingest the bread, when you ingest the bread, you are all partaking of how many loaves? One lump. See, Jesus is giving the picture as this, if you have me, that me that you have is in Val too, by the way. That me that you have is in Amanda also, and in Eduardo. And that makes me one with you and you one with one another. And so when you, t- and when, you take, when you take the wine, or in this case, the uh, Winn-Dixie brand grape juice, um, and I pour it into here, and I pour it into here, and I pour it into here, where is the source of this wine, if you will? It's from the one source, the one body where this wine came from. And so as we see this, we see everything emanates from the one loaf, the one body, the one blood. And so there is no way that any of us are in Christ and not one with him and the Father and the Spirit and one another. And is Christ divided from himself ever? So should his body be divided from himself itself ever? Even when we disagree? Even when we may not see eye to eye on things? I can still disagree with you, but guess what? I'm still one with you. I may not like you very much, (laughs) but that's not even an open, because God has made me one with him and one, and therefore one with one another. So what I'd like us to do is this. Um, uh, Would you table host, just come up real quickly. Would you help me with this? 
And I want us to take the time tonight to, to really see this, to not lose sight of the fact that this one loaf, which this must not, they must not have cooked this bread all the way through. Um, <laughs> would you guys, I w- I'd like you just to pass this to those at your table. So this is just, if I may just take another second here. Um, I know that we come from different traditions of communion. I don't want to be ignorant of that or or, um, unaware of that, and I don't want to be uh, uncaring or appear to be uncaring as to anyone's tradition. Uh, I'm just trying to be biblical, Um, just as Jesus did this. The picture of communion is a a whole, W-H-O-L-E, Christ, broken for a broken people. He who was whole was broken so that we who were broken can be whole. Not just whole individually, but all the parts of us make up the whole body of Christ. Whether those are believers of any denomination or no denomination, or don't even know of any that there's such a thing in denomination. They're believers that are in Africa, and God has reached them miraculously and informed them of the grace of God. And so I almost want to, if I could, just put an eraser on all of our brains, just for religious brains, so that we could just go back to that first communion. <laughs> and of course, that just brought pictures in my brain. Um, That first breaking of bread where Jesus said, the picture of my giving this to you is the picture of my giving myself to you and giving all those who will be in me to you and you to all those who will be in me so that the world will know Father, you love me and sent me so that everyone would know that you love me and sent me. And that would happen through a united church, through a body of men and women and boys and girls in Christ who realize they're on mission. They're on mission to know Christ and to make him known. And so the night that Jesus was betrayed the night that God had set in history, uh, Jesus took bread and he gave it to his disciples and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is given for you. When you do this, remember why. Just don't, don't go through some ceremony because it's what you're supposed to do because that's what Christians do. They go to communion. Remember what's happening. I'm putting myself into you and into others so there is a new creation, a new body, a new people, a new race. When you do this, remember that I am with you and I am in you and I am with your brothers and sisters and I am in your brothers and sisters regardless of nationality, ethnicity, denomination and this is how the world will know that you are my disciple as you walk out what I've put in you and I've put myself into you let's take the bread just think about this as you chew Think about this. God so loved you and me that he broke his son. Just as we are chewing the bread now, we are breaking the bread and ingesting this. We'll eliminate this bread, but this Christ who is in us will never leave us. Thank you.
God, grant us revelation to see what you desire for us to see through this sacrament. And when supper was ended, again he thanked the Father, and he took the cup, and he said, this is the cup of my blood. And he could have gone on to say, you see this cup that represents my blood, it will be poured out, and it will cover all of your sins, past, present, and future so that you will stand clean before me forever and that you will see one another as clean before me forever so that even when we don't like it, when we don't like it or we don't live like it, we will see ourselves as Christ sees us and we will love one another in spite of our faults and failings because we have been made one with the one who was broken for us. Let's take the cup. Father, thank you that as you had me right here, one bread equals one body, one wine equals one blood, and that equals one, one new creation in Christ. The church, Lord, I know we have many opinions of the church, but you have one opinion of the church. Those are my blood-bought ones. Those are the ones I have called to myself, chosen, sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, forgiven, redeemed, made known the mystery of my will, lavished life on. Father, would you grant us, Lord, um, a fresh new picture of the sacrament of communion so that we will see that it does declare our union with you and our union with one another and that to be one with you is to be one with one another and it can be no other way may we see this Lord and may Lord we fulfill in the power of your spirit a command that we cannot we cannot fulfill ourselves, and that is to love one another just as in the same way that you have loved us. We cannot do that. We have no power to do that apart from your Holy Spirit. So that, Lord, all people will know that we are your disciples. We are your kids. And that through that, they would, by your Spirit, be drawn to be your kids as well. So God, please give us a new picture, a new vision, a deeper vision of this unity and then just what that means to you and what that is to mean to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, let's take a quick break and then we'll hang out for the next 25 minutes or so. Thank you, guys.